Friday, Feedback Friday, the feedback is day of the week. Ha! I'm going to start right with my question for Feedback Friday because it's something that's driving me crazy. So the question for the week is very technical people out there who have a working knowledge of Skype and the Avar call recording software. Why are my remote call ends recording so overmodulated, so high? My microphone is a lot lower than the others, and I thought Skype was supposed to automatically balance this out. You can actually hear my voice raising at the end. Like if there's crosstalk, I can hear myself louder, and then it drops on the on the local side. So my audio is getting mixed down. Why is this? Someone please tell me. Okay, on to your comments. Um, Momo Monday this week, the comments, I can't believe I'm gonna say this, but just go read the comments on that video. I know this is like the most bizarre, this is the unicorn of YouTube telling people to go read the comments. This is the reason I continue to do Momo Monday segments, even though they don't tend to get the traffic of other videos, because it actually creates a mental health dialogue. And sometimes you have to do things because they matter, not because they're popular. And th this was one of those segments that people share their own experiences and talk about their own things. And it is always so humbling to see people feeling like they can take that risk and it's gonna be okay. And like I said, that's very humbling. One person talked about the whole idea of boundaries and not feeling bad that you can only take in so much at any given time. And that is so true. That is something I had to learn myself for various reasons. I always wanna give other people the chances I don't feel I get. And sometimes that makes it difficult to walk away or just put a conversation on pause or you know, listen to those instincts of self-preservation. It's a constant challenge. There's no right or wrong answers. and. What I had to start telling myself is that you are not required to speak to anyone. That is not what free speech means. Free speech means that you can say anything you want, but free speech also means that people don't have the right, you know, people have the right to not listen to you. That's the freedom of assembly part of it in, in mirror, right? Just because you accept the idea of, of free speech as a rule doesn't mean you have to listen to every ridiculous thing and then you get into the whole thing of well you also have to expose yourself to difficult ideas but there's there's difficult and challenging and then there's flat out insulting and abusive and it I, it's a learned skill knowing how to tell which is which and some people have foundations in early life that allow them better boundaries in this regard, but but some people, and there's this one comment that I really related to, the idea that when you're quiet, people ignore you. Uh, this, this one person said that um, they expected the video to be about how, you know, receiving kindness can help. And maybe I'll do a video about that on next Monday because I thought that went without saying, but obviously not based on this response but they they talked about um there's there's another side to sort of being quiet not being bullied in school which is uh people with social anxiety and therefore who don't speak much tend to get ignored and believe it or not i i can relate to that i know that people uh, would are always surprised when I say I was I was incredibly shy as a kid, like literally painfully shy. I still have days that are like that, and that's why I kind of you know the the Baldur's Gate choir, the I'm actually quite shy. That that guy, that's sort of my, one of my spirit animals, and it it does. I mean, I am so not used to giving, being given a vehicle to be heard. I cannot stand editing my own content. And that's part of the reason some of my videos end up being so long because I just want to record them and put them up there before I chicken out. 
having to look at my own face and listening to my own voice, it's really tough because I still labor under this belief. No one gives a shit about what I think, right? And I know a lot of people can relate to this. I've heard it. Part of the reason I started doing YouTube content because I'm like, wow, you know, someone should go out there and speak for the people who feel like nobody listens to them. At least maybe some people will start listening to me. And it's, it's tough when you see people who know how to shock more than anything else doing better than the people who really know what they're talking about. And that's why these Momo Monday segments are so important because it's always the thing of, oh, that didn't do so well again. And you kind of feel disappointed because I think it's really good content. It doesn't get the clicks because it's not shocking, right? But then I read the comments and it's this quality over quantity thing. And it's a really important thing to remember. And I do agree that you should show more kindness to people. And I think I part of the reason I came at it is like, hey, treat people the way you want to be treated, golden rules sort of thing, is because I, I admit I am a little shell-shocked with the negativity I get every time I say, hey, you know, maybe we should be nicer to each other. I mean, what what was the big thing that everybody got so angry at me about with the conclusion to Gamer's Guide to Feminism, the thing about trash talk. And while I see, I understand the point of, and, and I agree, if nobody's bothered by it, go nuts. I, I, I don't know why anybody would take what I said to that extreme, especially since I said avoid extreme trash talk, not any trash talk. But people took it beyond what what I actually said. I don't know why anybody would think I'd be advocating for no, never, never shit talk your buddies, even when no one else is around, even when no one's getting hurt. That's that's foolish. I I don't know when being aware when other people are uncomfortable and making that matter fell out of fashion. And perhaps because I myself am an introvert, I'm more aware when someone is being quiet because they don't know, not they don't know how to express themselves when they finally get a chance to talk. They're actually quite brilliant, but they don't know how to speak and be heard instead of speak and be attacked. And... There's a lot of really brilliant opinion being lost to us because people just assume, and, and rightly, these people aren't wrong, that people are going to attack them before they listen to them. And I hate to say it, that's true. That's true. The reality is right now, more often than not, you're not going to get a hearing. You're going to get the, ah, and the wave it off. Or you're going to get attacked on the internet. I'm not just talking about the internet either, by the way. I have had many people, so many people do that to my face when I voice a dissenting opinion. It happens in meetings. It happens in my family. It happens, you know, among groups of friends. And groups of friends are one thing because you're all sitting around talking and, you know, it's more familiar and someone may go ah, and then the next minute realize they should listen but I have become more and more aware of the way certain people just shut down dissent and don't even give a reason they're just in a position of power and they can go and decide to ignore you well, that's actually not good leadership, but there's a lot of not good leadership going on right now. And and I hope through a certain amount of me talking about it and then somebody else is still talking about it and then somebody else with an actual platform will take this idea and go with it. I hope that things get better and real leadership comes back because this is actually killing innovation. It's not killing, but it's 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 hobbling it. Right. It's reducing the amount of good ideas that get a chance because the aggressiveness of the speaker 
is the significant variable, not the quality of the idea. Enough said there, moving on. The next video was my attempt at a shorter video on the Oscars. Uh, someone bothered to comment, say they really didn't like it. They liked the longer ones. So I, I guess the answer is to just do both. Um, do make sure there's one short video a week and then let the others go longer. I, I don't have enough days in the week to do all the content that I want to do. I might actually have to start going um, on again, off again cycles. There, a big issue I'm having right now is there aren't enough hours in the day. There aren't enough days in a week. There aren't enough weeks in a month. One person got on me again about this equality of outcome versus equality of opportunity argument. And it's that whole, I'm a white guy and I have to work, spec script, blah, 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 Hollywood, life's not fair, all this stuff. I admit I see red every time someone throws that equality of opportunity versus equality of outcome at me. Because I never advocate quotas. I do not believe we will ever see perfect parity on things. The concern I have is that people give lip service to the idea that everybody is created essentially equal in terms of capacity, that we do no longer believe that say black men are intellectually inferior to white men, just as one example. We know that individualism and access to education are far more powerful factors than race or gender in those regards. I am not talking about sex typical upper body strength or anything like that. I am talking about aptitudes in, in this case, we're talking about acting, you know, the, and if you truly believe that, that people are in, inherently equal, not identical, but equal, the artist Chaos talked about it as equivalent, then we would expect far less of a divide than we are seeing. That's the point. I was stunned to find out that Mayor Shala Ali was the first Muslim person to win an acting Oscar. That doesn't make any sense to me except on one point. And I'm making this point simply to show that we shouldn't ignore data just because we don't like the potential outcome we extrapolate. I know when I was working on, on the late night show on Ed and Red's Night Party, I went out and tried to find a diverse cast of supporting people and, and our, our supporting cast was overwhelmingly female because it was dancing girls and people in the hot tub and, and things like that. And I had a very hard time casting a woman from a Middle Eastern background because even though they were doing modeling and dancing at, at clubs, that was different than being on a mass media outlet where their parents could see them. And so, you know, the reasons that there is this disparity in the Academy Awards may not be the reasons that some people would knee jerk think it was. But that doesn't mean we don't stop and realize that, hey, this is an indicator of something. It's not that there were few Muslim people. There were none. That uh, living in Toronto, I am not used to environments where there is no Muslim people. You go to comic book conventions, there's Muslim people. You go to tech events, there's Muslim people. Like it is, it is so odd to me that in a big cosmopolitan metropolitan industry like Hollywood, you wouldn't see that. And too often people get ahead of themselves when looking at data and try to dismiss the data because they don't like what the data might mean. And this is unscientific, fearful thinking. I know there's a big fear that white men are being pushed out of the equation and there's this pressure for men to be providers. And so 
how do I put this? I want to be very careful how I say this, but but I understand that there is greater social pressure for men to be successful the the but in 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 career the measure of a man is of, is often connected to the job there is more stigma on a guy who wants to be a stay-at-home dad versus a woman who decides to be a stay-at-home mom not that there isn't a huge amount of stigma for women who want to be stay-at-home moms in this day and age just saying right i recognize that sensitivity and that makes these discussions difficult right also, historically, the idea of affirmative action and just, oh, you have to hire a candidate that matches this description. This has made this discussion difficult as well because it was a Band-Aid. Now, everybody knew it was a Band-Aid at the time, but it was something they could do right then while they dug into the larger, more complex, messier problem. The problem with legislation is that band-aids tend to stick a, stick around, pardon the pun, a really long time. And, and by the time the underlying issue is addressed, that band-aid is so gross and smelly and dirty and it's lost all its stickiness, but people keep slapping it back on because that fight was hard enough. The, the current paradigm of perpetual resource scarcity when it comes to decent paying jobs has put us at each other's throats in a way that I think is socially unhealthy. It looks a lot like the 1920s and the 1930s before the, the stock market crash to me, historically. It looks like some of the stuff that's going on in Africa over, you know, fights over resources that get covered up as other things. And we have to be better than that. As people who have a, a humanistic worldview, as people who, you know, don't believe in divine right of kings or divine right of anything. You're either somebody who believes that the world is controlled by forces outside you, or you're a person who believes that you can do something about your personal situation. You can't have absolute control, but there are things you can do to make your personal situation better than it is right now. And that is a headspace. If you can't perceive it, if you can't conceptualize it, you can't do it. And I wish we could drop these slogans and drop these catchphrases like equality of opportunity, not equality of outcome, when it's, it's not applicable. Like, wh what does that even mean? I don't know. I get this thrown at me all the time and I have no idea what it even means because it's just this, I see it on Reddit. I see it on the Chan boards. It's just a, a lyric. It's a mantra. It's a school cheer. Get down to work. Start offering solutions. What do we do to make everyone's financial situation less precarious? That's what we need to figure out in the short term. Okay? Okay. On to my discussion with Troy Levitt. I was very glad that people got the fact that Troy was interviewing me and not the other way around. I was a bit concerned about that format. I was responding to a video that Troy made about wanting somebody, another feminist who is more famous and more influential than I am, but she's not going to do it. So I said, hey, I know I'm not her, but... I'll do it. I'll, I'll let you ask me questions. And he asked some challenging questions that provided very lengthy answers. And again, I'm, I'm not used to not having the constant push. I'm, I realized talking to Troy that I am so used to being interrupted all the time, having people cut in and, you know, cut me off that I have a tendency to just keep talking until somebody interjects. And that was an interesting wake up call because man, I went on long. I wasn't gonna edit it, but I'm like, this is boring. I'm talking for 25 minutes straight. I'm gonna cut some of these tangents. It's it's not you know, appropriate to, to this discussion. Let, let's keep it on topic. But it really taught me something about myself that I am so used to being shut down. I am so used to doors being slammed in my face. I am, am so used to just being interrupted, cut off and shouted down that 
when someone doesn't argue me, I talk forever. <laughs> so we're going to work on that. Um, but people still seem to enjoy the discussion. I think there's a lot of good stuff to come as well. But I wanted to talk about a comment where someone shared the uh, and they got a bit ahead of stuff we talked about in the uh, in, in subsequent parts. But they talked about their own experiences with gender studies classes. And they're very similar to what mine were. And it's um, it's long, but I think it's worth reading because what they basically said, I'll try to summarize. A large problem I have with feminist pop culture critique is this sort of catch-22 situation where you have people saying women don't have to follow these rigid gender roles, a good and true statement, while at the same time perpetuating other rigid gender roles and even sometimes they perpetuate the same roles. For example, women aren't all passive victims, but they still use the term male violence as if only men are ever violent or aggressors. Also, these aren't mutually exclusive in my opinion, but that's a whole nother topic. That's not even getting to the behaviors certain feminist critics express side eyes Twitter. So you've got people supposedly fighting for all women only actually caring about certain types of women while throwing under others under the bus. This is a, a central challenge, a central problem when it comes to feminism as a tent. And it comes from a full half of the population being treated as minorities. Why do, I, why do I point this out? Well, half isn't a minority, right? But women are lumped into this minority status thing because of historical patriarchy. And, and you, you can argue that patriarchy doesn't exist today. It's inarguable that it existed back in the day. Women couldn't vote. Women couldn't own property. Women couldn't even keep the wages they earned in a job. They had to turn it over to either their husband or their father because, and it was out of a sense of misguided kindness. Managing money was just too stressful for the feminine mind, right? That was the thinking. It wasn't, we're going to be terrible to women. We're going to be kind to women and take these stresses off their poor, fragile little shoulders. We're, because these organizations and groups and methods of thought came from that place, a lot of them are still infected with the ideology of inequality. A lot of feminist thought actually backdoors, assumes inferiority of women and this idea that we, we somehow have to cover up and, and cover over inherent inferiority. And I have a real issue with this. There's this element of irrealism in feminist game criticism in that they want female characters to represent the audience instead of representing the role the character is supposed to embody, right? One of my big complaints in the way female playable characters are sculpted is they're not designed looking like they have upper body strength. And, and this is a very personal thing for me because I used to do acrobatics. I used to do gymnastics. I, there's a yearbook photo of me picking up the student council president, who was a, a pretty big guy, on my shoulder. I was strong. But when your body develops to have those muscles, you're considered unfeminine, which is, of course, that connection with femininity and inherent weakness that I reject. And, and so I want to see female playable characters who look like they belong in the jobs they're doing. And it has been a big, I remember it was the show Dark Angel that really hit this home for me. I'm a big science fiction fan, you may have noticed. But those characters were superhumanly strong because apparently the, the tensile fiber strength, the, the fibers in their muscles were stronger than regular people's. And so they were super strong. But they had Jessica Alba, who's this teeny little wafy girl. And she was as physically strong as the six foot tall, broad, broad shouldered guy that was also in this genetic experiment program. And I argue with my husband like crazy that based on that sci-fi premise, that it is the 
tensile strength of the muscle fiber that makes them super strong and makes their bows not break and, and all that stuff, then more muscle would still mean more strength. He could overpower her. If they had made it magic or a tactile telekinesis field or something like that, I would not have that problem. But it was what they set up. They cast an actress that didn't match it. That, I think, is what we should be striving for in art. If you're going to make a, f uh, a woman who's a firefighter, Make her look like a real life firefighter. Actually have the audience read firefighter when they look right at her. Because these shorthands, as I, as I talked about with Troy, these shorthands are super important. Does this person look like they could do what they're doing? And this goes for guys as well. I mean, the reason I love the game Alan Wake is the developers, well, one of the reasons, it's a beautiful game. But they deliberately didn't give him a melee attack. Because he's this noodly armed writer. He doesn't know how to throw a punch. He barely knows how to use a gun at the beginning of the game. So they deliberately made that choice because the character made sense with what you could do with him, right? And we've got these people who are not just climbing things. They're climbing things consistently. They have a ton of endurance, but they don't make these characters, and it's true of the men to an extent, but it's more true of female playable characters. They don't hire Olympic athletes who do this sort of endurance sport and model the bodies based on that. They hire models. And But what's happening in gaming? People are arguing for realism. And so we have this Mass Effect Andromeda thing. And I like I haven't played Mass Effect Andromeda. I want to be clear. I haven't given previews. EA doesn't give me anything. And it would be smarter for EA to start giving me things because if I can actually look at what's actually going on, I'll probably be kinder to your product. I can only look at what I have. And best evidence we have right now is they hired a model and then fucked up her face for reasons I cannot understand. And some people say it's bad motion capture, that, that visual capture doesn't capture women as well as men. And this is true. I have done the process. But it goes beyond that. Be because I have seen what my own face does in those capture programs. They change the shape of her jaw. I, I think, uh, as I said in, in the Thursday video, I think we do have to expand the definition of what is beautiful. And I do think that there are, are in some cases, that they miss the opportunity to make supporting characters who aren't as athletic be more representative of what people in those jobs actually look like. Watch Dogs 2 did a beautiful job of this. They had a real diversity of character. Not everybody looked like a muscle-bound He-Man. And it's funny because of all the companies, Ubisoft is the most ripped game designers in the world. They are all way super muscular for reasons I don't understand. So why can't other developers... And this, again, this isn't a representation argument. This isn't about making the character look like the audience. It's making the character be consistent with that world. I don't think anyone without an agenda is going to complain if there's a few super glamorous women. If there are other women who are beautiful in different ways. And hopefully I've made my point here. Hopefully I've, I've distinguished the difference between um, representing the audience and actually making your character make sense in the role they're supposed to do in games. And I think this is a major flaw with contemporary feminist uh, analysis of all media, but I care about video games, that it's not about representing the audience. It's about representing real life women in those roles. Most people don't go climbing mountains for a living, right? A lot of people have never fired a gun, never mind fired a gun with expertise. I don't want a video game character to necessarily look like me. And I know this is ironic right now because more than a few people have commented on my, my resemblance to Aloy in Horizon. Like even the face shape, it's kind of bizarre. But I don't need game characters to look like me. 
I need their narrative and backstory and role to match their appearance. And these noodly armed characters that were given, and I'm like, guys, it's the same way, right? Like, they look like bodybuilders instead of gymnasts, and then they're doing these feats of athletic ability. Like, come on. I know power armor is a thing, and that sort of explains why Master Chief and Gears of War people are freaking giant. But make them look like what they're supposed to do, please. I don't know about you guys. I'm tired of having the same debate over and over and over again. We need to resolve some of these issues. We're going in circles. And the reason we're going in circles is we're talking past each other. We're not sitting down in a room with some drinks and everyone's comfortable and there's no audience and trying to bang out. What can we really do here? What's reasonable to expect? What are a set of goals? development challenges that we can work towards in gaming that makes sense for our industry. We're constantly reacting to external criticism that may or may not make sense. We can be as progressive as we want, but consumer products need to be consumed for them to make more consumer products, right? So this is obviously something I'm going to talk about more, but I hope that... I'm gonna have to explain this again at some point, and it is exhausting because for me, there's nothing more frustrating than people putting words in my mouth. I misspeak and I say things that are wrong and I say things that are downright stupid enough that people do not have to read into what I say. And so it's super frustrating when people do. So uh, I'm gonna leave it there. Have a good weekend. See you back on Monday.